He's the general editor of the Collective Works of Human Development, recent past president of the Association for Scottish Literary Studies, author of Representing Scotland and Arts and Resistance, and also a very accomplished poet in his own right, authored five acclaimed volumes of verse, most recently Homecoming. Now, those of you who have heard Alan speak at various events we've held over the past few days, um, we'll know the kind of treat given for this afternoon. Uh, on most of these occasions, Alan has been speaking very cogently and lucidly about the poetry of other people, but today we get the big pleasure of hearing Alan read his own work. So Alan's going to read for about 20-25 minutes, then take some questions and perhaps finish off with some more of his own poems. So, could you please join me in giving a warm welcome to Alan here. Thanks very much, Liam. Can you, if I stand here, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yeah. Go away with the technology. It's always a threat. Um, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming to some familiar faces and uh, people that I haven't seen before. Um, I now work at the University of Glasgow, but for 14 years I worked at the University of Waikato. Um, and when I first came to New Zealand, I was um, ridiculously young for my age. I um, had no idea what I was coming to, uh, really. Um, and it was a leap in the dark. I didn't know anybody here at that time. Um, I remember one of my uncles telling me that I should buy a horse as soon as I arrived here. A state of ignorance prevailed in the family. <laughs> um, I had written poems and attempted to write poems and scribbled words on paper <coughs> in, the, in the emulation of poetry um, since I've been at school. And when I came here, I put everything that I'd written, some of them had been published at that stage in magazines and journals, and I put them all into a box and put it under the desk in my parents' house, in my room in my parents' house, and left them there. And I figured that if I uh, needed them or wanted them or was going to treat, treat this seriously, and they would be published for other people to read, then I would find out about it. Um, I wouldn't be able to do without them. And it took about two months. Uh, of living here before I wrote back to my, phone, my parents and said, please can you get that box, etc. <coughs> so that first year was particularly formative in that sense, and uh, the first book appeared from Auckland University Press, uh, and at that point they were in conjunction with, with Oxford University Press, so I thought that's okay, that's, that's a nod of approval, and um, it's quite welcome. And I'd also written a long sequence in that first year while I was living here, uh, <laughs> mainly about being lonely, <laughs> um, but also about um, trying to find out what it was like to be um, somewhere else. I've always been elsewhere, in a sense. This now, in the last ten years, is the longest time I've spent uh, actually living in Scotland. I was born in Scotland, um, but my father was a, a pilot on the Thames. He took ships down the river. Uh, so we, I actually grew up in, in Kent. I went to school in Kent, going back to Scotland all the time, so the magnet the north was always drawing us back. But I remember um, that early disjunction of, of language and sound and experience and trying to find what, what it was like elsewhere, not to be entirely comfortable in only one place. When I was going back to visit my parents after some time in Scotland, I was going to visit a friend of mine uh, whose mother had uh, recently had a heart attack and she was recovering. I wanted to take her as a present, and uh, I thought, you know, I can't take, them a, take her a bottle of wine or a box of chocolate, so I, I thought, I'll take her a pineapple. <laughs> Healthy, you know, get So I went to the fruit shop in, in Kent, in, in Great and uh, asked for a pineapple. I come down from Scotland the day before with various Scottish currency, various Scottish banknotes, you know, we have our different designs. And uh, the, the fruit shop, this is a good number of years now, this is in the 1980s, I guess. Um, the fruit shop owner gave me the pineapple and I gave him a Scottish £10 note. On one side of this £10 note was a picture of David Livingstone, a famous Scot well known for his international travels. On the other side of it, there was uh, a picture of uh, oh, various African warriors, Maasai warriors with spears, <coughs> uh, a guy in a, an Arab in a dow guy on a camel. And he took it and he said, what's this then, mate? What's this? I've never seen one of these before. 
say this, a Scottish £10 note, you know, it's legal currency, but you're not obliged to take it, but I've only got that in faith, and you, otherwise you'll lose the sale. And he said, no, no, that's fine, mate, that's no bother at all, we'll take it, we'll take it, we'll take your money. Just that I'd never seen one of these before, he turned around, Mabel, bring the kids! And the whole family. <laughs> <laughs> he says, look at this, kids, look at this, Scottish, £10 note, wonderful, eh? He turned it over, all right, look at that. Do they all look like this in Scotland then? <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to be clever, I was trying not to be outdone. So in the, the chain she gave me, there was a Bank of England five pound note. So I paused and looked at it and said, Who's this woman? <laughs> Quick as a flash, she said, That's Margaret Thatcher, mate. <laughs> he won. <laughs> The first book um, has the art of the title, um, this folding map, and I'll read this first poem in it uh, called The Blues, it's a not entirely serious kind of love poem. The lights are on all over Hamilton, the sky is dark, blue, as a stained glass window in an unfrequented church, say by Chagall. Grand and glorious chinks of pinks and purples, glittering jewels on those glass fronted buildings where the lifts are all descending and the doors are being closed. You're out there somewhere, going to a concert in wide company, or maybe sitting somewhere, weaving a carpet like a giant tapestry, coloured grey, pale bright, weaving the wool back in at the edges of the frame, your fingers deaf as they turn the wool in tight and gentle or somewhere else. What do I do except imagine you? The river I keep crossing keeps going north. The trains in the night cross it too. Their silver carriages are blue. It's the silver fern of the train that is blue in the night time. <coughs> And then there's another uh, one from that, from that first year, um, travelling away up to the <coughs> north point of the North Island, Spirits Bay, <coughs> thinking of the story of the, the Maori legend of the, or Maori myth of the, of the notion of returning from that point. And Spirits Bay, the empty sea. You cannot miss the ships that miss each other, ships that the wide earth parts. Sliding waters beat them all. And all the ships come in. The Tasman nudges off the Cape, the subtle stern of long Pacific slats. The Cape runs ragged down the land and saturates into the oceans. Our attic, yet the sand is scald, is beaten gold. The rocks as black, the grass topped hill, bright emerald, the lighthouse, lighthouse white. Have I come these 20,000 miles to be beaten by an empty wind? The ruin or the blank in our own eye. The axis of vision is not coincident with the axis of things. Therefore, the words, world lacks unity, said Emerson. He sang, don't fence me in. The palisades surround the lighthouse. Even out there, where the two seas say hello to each other, they're shaking hands with rippling knuckles, as white as waves are on cobalt. So there's a kind of... Um, aspect of humour uh, and a kind of seriousness as well that happens. I don't know, but maybe there's an aspect of uh, Scottish writing that comes through. Very often in Scottish literature, Liam will uh, disagree with me instantly. <laughs> Very often in Scottish literature there are funny things, funny poems or humorous aspects that abet a serious point. It's not very often that you find something that's entirely frivolous or totally solemn. Very often they're, they're somehow coming together. Anyway, the, set, the third, actually the third book, the second book was called An Open Return. <laughs> and this is the third book, um, also written and published here in New Zealand, called First and Last Songs, which is a uh, code, the title of this is a code. Uh, it simply means um, love poems and elegies, first songs and, and, and last songs. Um, it's about uh, love and death, it almost falls of time. It's about uh, meeting new people that you want to be with here and recognizing people who are dying, older members of your family who you're not going to see again there. 
So it's a kind of um, recognition of what the, what the story is um, in that context. Let me read, um, oh, I'll read a half poem. Poem about fourth. Last night my two feet lay on each other, warm as toast, in my single bed between clean sheets, till I rose, padded over the New Zealand wool carpet to the kitchen linoleum, I sat down at the table and wrote about your two feet in your socks, tramping somewhere north of the equator in the middle of my night. I was thinking of how my two feet had lain there sleeping, folded like cats twitching, wondering where your two feet which wanted them to play with, where and how they would have been so much happier sleeping near to each other, four familiar feet, hard, soft and warm, in a single bed, somewhere with you alone. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a, well, the story. This is the story, isn't it? Um, so I'm working at the English department, teaching Scottish literature subversively at the uh, University of Waikato with the enormously good support of some of the best colleagues I've ever known uh, and the absolute hostility of some of the worst. <laughs> <laughs> and I go into the library and looking for an obscure Scottish novel of the 1940s and ask the prettiest librarian I can find if you can get it from me. She does and she marries me. So I go to New, come to New Zealand here for one year. Uh, first of all, a choice of one or three years. One year I think will be enough. Fourteen years later, married, two children, two boys, we go back. But here's a wedding poem for you, called Necessity of Listening. It's a marvellous friend of mine, a man called John Purser, who uh, did a big series about Scottish music, of all kinds, Scotland's music, wonderful book. I recommend it completely. If the library doesn't have it, you must get it immediately. It's Scotland's music, um, about all of Scotland's music. He did a radio series based on this. So this is a kind of letter to John called Necessity, the Need for Listening. Love makes belief in miracles. And the future brings its own time, not the past's predictions. You're right enough, John. We should be content, contented. Today, your new boat rests in chuckling water moored near Glasgow. Soon you will take it to sky. Your hand will rest and move on the tiller. <coughs> Tonight, my wife, her hand upon my arm, now knows no source for its resting. Her sleeping smile is unknowing as I am. Her comfort content is my own, her husband. So we, um, we go back. Uh, Scotland on the 1st of January 2001 and various aspects of being in New Zealand are haunting and continue to, to haunt the imagination in a good way. We talked a lot in the symposium last week about the anxieties of exile and the, and the pain of distance and so on. And that's true, that's part of it. <coughs> um, and I think I mentioned before that you know, Robert Louis Stevenson has a letter uh, from Samoa where he's talking about um, what he misses about Scotland that is so identifiably uh, Scottish, that is so that bites at the heart. Fair enough. And, um, and I remember writing uh, a letter home saying um, you know, what I miss family, friends, particular landscapes, particular views, particular places that you could be in, and then I found the hand going Scotch pies. <laughs> Iron brew, <laughs> Tullock's marshmallow tea cakes, and I got a reply from my pal saying, uh, Alan, I've always admired your insistence upon including the ugly alongside the good and the bad, but which category Tullock's marshmallow tea cakes fall into that? <laughs> um, so the good, the, the, the good aspect of it though is um, the privilege uh, of having been here, of being, of not being here again. What a glorious day. Port of Auckland. My parents came out to visit. Um, my father, as I said, was a pilot on the Thames, ships down the river, he was a seaman. 
And we went up to what was then, uh, I'm not sure if it's still there, is it still there? Kelly Tarleton <coughs> was under the water. It was great. Um, but, our, but, but our oldest spy, our, our, our first son, was with us. And it was great because you went around on this conveyor belt with the sharks and the fish swimming over above you. And then you went upstairs to this really nice fish restaurant and ate them. <laughs> and, uh, we took a walk down the road afterwards out to the spit and um, saw a ship coming in. And, well, I'll, I'll read the poem and then I'll tell you the secret. Port of Auckland. I couldn't see it was, it was um, we found out from the New Zealand Herald the next day what ship it was. So that's the epigraph to the poem. New Zealand Herald, 9-12-98, shipping news from Sydney, 12.45 p.m., Botany Bay. Too far away the ship swings in. My father's eyes clock funnel, colours, movement, recognise. Bayline. I listened to his pilot's voice quietly speak Scots. I stood upon that bridge along the London River, some other morning now too old to detail, but close enough to know. The sun and stars and moon make charts to keep us moving. On Orakai Jetty by Bastion Rock, a spit reaching out from the near, it seems as though it might go on forever into blatant sky. We pause before we back along and watch her slowly clear. My young son takes my hand, suddenly scared of the wind he walks into will rise. And later we found my father uh, went to a reunion of ship's captains back in Scotland. And he met the man who was the captain of that ship on that day. And he was able to tell him how strange it was that we had seen it because he was actually going to the port of Auckland and then he was going straight up to Japan. The ship was about to be sold for scrap and broken up and destroyed. So it's just one of those wee moments of connection. <coughs> Wellington Harbour, you're half asleep. Outside the street lights go. The air comes gently southwards through the open window. The hillside houses, the slanted roof, the helmet the slightly skewed. The cluttered garments, toys and boots, it hardly worries you. Sleep slowly lifts our quiet bed as magic carpets. Meanings turn to fancies. Christmas to new year and this December season's residue. Then a dream from far away. A book you thought you knew opens on your own name, staring back at you. The voice breathes out, I go, I go, close the door, each one. The yellow light of air come through the window. Then, hold on, a soft summer night. Hold on, ambiguity, hold on, let go. That was the last book that I wrote, really, here, um, and it was first published then, both here and in Scotland, when I got back. Uh, it ends, really, with the title book called The Clearances. Uh, the Clearances, you talk about the Clearances. I actually I wondered about entitling the book Clearances, etc. <laughs> Ian Clyde Smith, the great Gallic poet, said, it's time we stop talking about the Clearances. Sometimes feel that way about Robert Bobbins. Um, this is a poem about the good aspect of clearances, which is to say, at the end of your term, when you go somewhere else, you put your forearm on the desk, having tried to deal responsibly with everything you can, and you do that. It's about our first wee boy. And it's about a beautiful part of this that we went to often called the Coromandel Peninsula. We were there, and our friend who was there was going to have to leave that place for health reasons. And we knew we were going to have to leave. But it's about, it's about the goodness of having to do that sometimes. Clearances for James is the wee baby. 
The clouds go over singly or in fleets, trailing raggedly back against the sky where looming vaults of rain <coughs> come over it. Then the sky lets loose, the shades of grey become uncountable. The rain comes down on everything, diagonal, banks. The windows, roof, the wooden deck, the trees around, the green slopes run with mud. The fields below are soaked and filled. The road becomes a grey and moving river. The baby hasn't heard this sound before. The heavy rain on the iron roof and cries himself to sleep at last as the downpour eases off. It must be time to move. The weather is an actual farewell. I used to think the old gales of Ireland or the west of Scotland knew so little of our modern world. It seemed they were a pastoral people and burdened with a culture of conservatism. But clearances are always strong in the mind. The images recur, the rubble of the ruined homes, the ghosts of children, animals, and men and women helpless in the face of the event. Farewells and birth, there are some things no clues or forms of knowledge alter in themselves. I won't say they can't help. They knew about departure, those old people, and the kinds of life we deal with here require that inherited wisdom. Now, the heavy showers have passed, but different shades of grey reflect, refract, unnumbered tones of light. It's time to pack what we have and can carry. It's time to take what we can and go. The boy will not remember this, the landscape of his parents, unless we do. I'll pause for a minute, and in a minute. Um, actually, I'll pause with another word uh, for Cleans, and then I'll use them in the last book, in the last section. This is a, these things happen sometimes very fortunately. Um, you're invited to give a reading of poems that you like, and on this occasion, uh, there was a poem that I particularly uh, enjoyed by the Russian, great Russian poet, um, Mayakovsky, and it's called A Proper Respect for Horses. I did the job. He was a Russian expert at Waikato, and we, he helped me enormously. A very good guy. Um, we went to the original uh, poem and we looked at it and listened to it and heard the sound of it. We looked at various different translations and looked at different ways of expressing different parts of the poem. And then I put together a version that I wanted to make for myself. So, a proper respect for horses. Horse hoofs clattered. Clatter clunk, clatter clunk, clunk, clatter clunk, clatter clunk. Wind shoved on the slippery ice on its shoes in the street, in a trice, in a beat, in a skid. Its legs went out from under it. Crump! And all at once the mocking crowd appeared, and with their big mouths gawping, oh, go, ho, he, ho, ha, ha, surrounded it in their fancy flared jeans, all the fashion just then. The poor old horses slipped, the tired old horses down, they sneered. And all along Kuznetsky they howled at him and laughed. All except for me. I didn't join that crowd to laugh at us. I went right up and looked into that chestnut eye. The street tipped over like a glass off a table. While I knelt there to see. The teardrops scrambled down the cheek and neck and slipped into her mane and hide, and some strange sort of common sense spilled out of my heart and flowed, running like a waterfall, suddenly undammed. Oh, horse, don't cry. Listen to me now. Don't think that they're any better than you. Oh, child, don't you know? Horses are we all, to be honest, in the end. Everyone's a horse, in some kind of way. Oh, well, maybe she was old and wise and didn't need my words. Or maybe I was just too soft. But there and then, the horse jerks up, clatters to her feet, whinnies in the frosty air, and gallops down the street. My chestnut child, with a flick of her tail like a yearling, she canters into her stall, ready for work once again for the life that's worth it all.
for questions, so I'm sure. 1990, I was at the <coughs> University of the North Island, whose name I couldn't even pronounce. And I ended up in, in that year arranging a series of winter lectures, which came together uh, in, a, in a book that was ultimately called after uh, Bill Manhire's piece as part of the winter lectures, Dirty Science. Yeah. One day I received a phone call from somebody who looks extremely like me. Graham, Graham, I've got a because I didn't like Dirty Silence, I've got a great name for your book, Doubtful Sounds. All these years on, do you still find doubt in the sounds of museum? I'm going to defer answering that to the poems that I'm going to read in a minute called, <laughs> called Doubtful Sounds. Oh, <laughs> Well, you've changed hugely. Not essentially. Hugely, but not essentially. Cool. Um, I was just wondering when you published your first volume, or, or you went to get your first volume published, was that quite a nerve wracking experience presenting your work for the yeah, first it was, time? It was, it was, um, yeah, you do. You had your heart in your mouth when you put something out to say, um, well, you know, I trust in this and let's see what other people think. It was a very, I had a wonderful response um, from a guy, a, a very fine poet, New Zealand poet, called Kendrick Smitherman, who is the reader for that book. And uh, he died, and his, um, the, the publisher, uh, Elizabeth Catherine, the University of Press, let me see what he'd written, which was very heartening. Uh, he'd said, uh, Let's not have any uh, conversation about whether this is a New Zealand poet or a New Zealand or New Zealand poetry or that nationalistic question. Here is poetry that happens to be written here, published book. And that's really at the heart of a lot of nationalistic um, uh, attitude, uh, and, it, and it addresses it in a way counters it. And I think I'm not I'm not saying that it's that one should not be nationalistic. I think in some ways New Zealand is a lot more nationalistic than Scotland. And I think that Scotland could learn a great deal from New Zealand in various ways. Um, but it was nice to, to see that um, here was a very fine New Zealand poet saying that this, this stuff is good, it's okay, publish it. But not, for, not, not, not on any kind of proviso, not because it was about uh, any particular stuff, things, dispositions or, or attitudes or endorsements. So I was lucky, I guess. I mean, uh, uh, that could as easily have gone a different way with another reader or, or something else happens. Mm. So, yeah, I was fortunate with that. It takes an immensely risky to do this sort of thing. I understand. Um, you, you mentioned earlier that you found it almost easier to write critical work on the storage tradition for and less distance. Do you find it easier to write poetry about storage and less distance? No, um, no, because I've written poetry about Scotland when I was in Scotland. Landscape. I was always interested in painting, uh, and I still am. I've still got that very. It's a great fascination to me about the relationship between how language works in, in narrative and in poetry, and how and how when it's dissociated from sentence structure, you've got things happening in terms of imagery and the line and the construction of the work, which relates in ways that are never defined to the construction of paintings. And the history of landscape painting from the 18th century through the, the contemporary uh, work. That, that kind of um, uh, aspect of it is, is partly to do with spectacle and the view, but it's also to do with engagement and being present in the landscape. And it can be a working landscape and economically viable place where you are with other people. So uh, what's informing the, the imagination is your relationship with others, um, is your presence but also your, your view of it from a distance. And that's a, that's a dichotomy, that's a, a dialogue or a, or a dialectic um, that continues. In that, in that sense, it doesn't matter where you are. You can be anywhere in this case. So Scotland, the, Scotland, the, thing is, the thing is, Scotland is always the subject. It's always, New Zealand is the subject too, and it was here. It still is to some extent. I mean, as I say, the one thing that still takes place. But, um, it's never one thing or the other. Mm -hmm. yeah.
So there's no chance we're going to tempt you back to live in New Zealand? You never know. <laughs> never say never. I don't know. I mean, I'm very happy where I am. And I'm very fortunate to be where I am. And, uh, but of course, you see, uh, I live in New Zealand. And uh, our sons are both uh, British passports and New Zealand passports. And I also am, in fact, a New Zealander. I have a New Zealand passport, which I acquired in the week before I left. On the grounds that uh, if the boys grow up and they're coming and going, you want to be able to come and go with us. And I earned it. I was here for long enough to earn it. And, uh, and the more passports you have, the better. Um, but, uh, but, but I don't... I, I, what I will say is that I always want to have a home in Scotland. Forever. Yeah. That's not to say that I won't be over here in the winters. There, come the summer. Here if, I'm, if I'm spare. Cool. Yeah. I should just read some more poems now. When I got back, um, I, 1st of January 2001, Ray and my wife and the boys stayed on for an extra month enjoying the summer. We had spent a few weeks with our mum uh, up in Pongaray, where it was weather like this. It was all sunshine and freshly laundered sand dunes and waves coming in that you could swim in every day and the a gorgeous. So I get off the plane and I turn up at, <coughs> in, in, at the Ayrshire where we're staying, uh, where we live, in the middle of winter, 1st of January, I phoned my boss at the time and say, I said, well, hey, you'll be tired from having been on that plane for a long time, take the morning off come in in the afternoon and the following day I said, don't worry, you can get an early uh, bus, there's an express bus service that leaves uh, um, the Alloway and comes straight to the university. Okay. Seven o'clock in the morning, for, uh, second, third of January, pitch black, horizontal rain, <laughs> wind that howls through the trees and along the dark winding road comes the lights of the bus which I get on and ask the driver if I could have a ticket to a university, please. And he says, Sorry, Paul, the bus you want the express bus service to the university. It'll be coming up behind us in a few minutes, and at this point, we'll look at it's overtaking us. Oh, no. <laughs> and my driver says, uh, Don't worry, Paul, sit down, we'll get him. <laughs> See that little speed? <laughs> through the, through the, streets of, the empty streets of air at 7 o'clock. <laughs> Of these long buses with the bendy bit in the middle. Eventually, my driver uh, screeches to a halt, overtakes the bus, screeches to a halt diagonally, cuts off the entire road, and sits there and goes, On you go there, pal, you'll be alright there. He's not going to get past us now. <laughs> <laughs> so I got home, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> um, so, this is the book. What happened, you see, was that I was. I, I got back in January and um, I was head of department uh, six months later and for six years I was occupied as um, doing, the, doing that work. So the kind of trajectory became very important uh, and, and, and slowly assembled, accumulated itself over, over ten years. And the, this book is called Homecoming. Um, the introduction begins with the uh, the words of uh, Nigerian writer Roy Sienka, uh, he says, Instinctively I turn towards the window when the captain announces that we have entered the Nigerian airspace. I'd love that. Get on a plane, the captain announces we are entering the Scottish airspace now. Edwin Morgan has a poem uh, called The Solway Canal, where he imagines a canal, a man-made canal being built from Solway to be a pleasure craft going along. Friendly passport. Um, so the, the thesis, I guess, of the of the book, the, the sense of nationality um, that's in it, that's explored in it as well as enforced, um, is essential. And a lot of it actually does come from seeing Scotland from outside, from the from the privilege of having of, of being here, of having been here. So there are those aspects that, that come through. 
first poem in the book is actually a New Zealand poem uh, on, on Matakana Island. The first thing I did for that first year I was to go to the Maori Studies Department and ask the head of the Maori Studies Department if I go on a Marae trip. And he gave me a hard time to begin with. He said, uh, you know, who do you think you are? What sort of cultural tourist do you think you are? What do you want? Uh, and I made my best explanations from bona fides and etc. I said, okay, and he gave me a couple of sheets of paper about protocol. And he said, there is protocol, and you will make mistakes, but you will be forgiven. Said, That's good, I like that. <laughs> On the island, Matakana, 1988, it wasn't the words. There wasn't any meaning to them. In the bar, I thought, have it your way. But then, you were there in that dark night, starless after the blaze of inside. The long road home was not to be seen in that blackness. Your voice was a nearness, a guide I had to keep close to, to keep to the road, the fields on either side. And gradually, the light began to allow me to see your shape against the island's rim, the ocean beyond. And here, long after your death, that there was that gradual way to find a way of seeing in that dark, as if there was no reason, even now, to be afraid of it. Do you ask the question about doubtful sound? Here's the answer. This book, the first section, the crowds of the book go from um, some poems that are quite easy and accessible to some poems that are obscure, yeah. or more obscure and, and more um, difficult to access. So here's a, a, an easy one, I guess, um, followed by the more complex one. Yeah. The same subject. The first one's called Where. At three, James points to the map, and I ask him, where do Nana and Grandpa live? In Scotland, he says, and points to it. They are Scottish. And where did Grandma and Grandpa live? New Zealand, he says, and looks across the world and points to it in Pomeray. And where do we live? In New Zealand. But we are Scottish too, he says. And looks up expectantly with wide blue eyes, the voice raised up at the end of the phrase, New Zealand, intonation, a question mark unspecified, too far away to be hopeful of any firm reply. Yes, I tell him, we are Scottish. He's been there twice, started moving, crawled fast and stand still to speed that first visit, and then before we left, a few steps, hesitant, from his grandmother's hands to his mother's. Now he sees the planes fly over in different directions, all of them heading one way. Where's that plane going? Going, I ask him. No hesitation. Certainty and patient for question and answer so doubtless, it's all. Yeah. <laughs> the second one is called By Doubtful Sound. The question was one of navigability, whether or not there was a way out. Cook wondered at it, scanned the inlets, salt or fresh, the alpine slopes above, narrowing from present place to distances to terminal points. He decided against it, but named the place before he left, and the name held fast. By doubtful sound, our bearings balance counterwise. South Island folds like cards against the north. Let's shuffle the deck. My love and I will look upon each other on the beach at doubtless Spain these summer months, December through to March. Only glad at moments we can spare to take what necessity gives, to remember roads not taken by doubtful sounds. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, in the last ten years, I've been lucky enough to travel uh, a bit and. Um, in 2004, I was invited to go to um, China, <coughs> and uh, the idea was for me as a, as a Scottish poet and a Scottish artist called Alexander Moffat, and an uh, Australian poet, Australian artist, and 20 Chinese artists and two uh, Chinese poets to go there and look at the landscape and respond to it, and the results in poems and drawings and paintings would be an exhibition to put forward. So this is a, there are a couple of poems from China. On the telephone, 
Standing in Xingping, in the street, the filthy, dusty drag of it, the high mountains all around it in the heat, and the telephone, talking to my wife in the green, wet, leafy cold of late November of Scotland. She's getting the boys ready for school at half past eight in the morning. I speak to my children, each in turn, James, Ted, and David, six, asking them what present they would like me to bring them from China. Each of them in turn, enunciating every syllable carefully, tells me anything, Daddy, except a book. <laughs> <laughs> I shall go to the ghost market in Beijing and buy two small iron dragons for them, that they might guard their wisdom and protect their independence. <laughs> Go to the post mark. <laughs> <laughs> Teapots, giant frogs, dragons, lions, ashtrays, steaming rice and noodles, glimpsed in chopsticks on the way from bowl to mouth, great croichels in the throats and gobs of phlegm and sneezes, wiped with fingers to the pavement, and bracelets, bangles, necklaces, and beads and statues carved in jade and rugs, and don't forget those human skull tops from Tibet, and phallus balls in black cold stone, and rows of dragons, camels, tigers, cigarettes, and smoke from men in corners, each surrounded by their boxes, stalls, and hanging screens, and silks, and Paper crinkle covered with calligraphy and little calls of hard cell chatter. Crowds that push the clack the clatter. March on chopsticks, food, the chairman Mao Alcox and the statuettes saluting at the bad old dusty books. The matter of the market is also real and fake, fast and furious, running in the veins of the curious pause and push and pass the avenues and corridors and lanes. Between the stalls, the women in their furry hats, the men with pocket calculators held out in their open hands. And how much does it cost? How much will you pay? How many objects here are on display? How many people did you pass today? How many ghosts walked through you on your way? Mm. Mm. Then there are a, a few poems about other places. Um, having visited other places for various reasons, either um, through work as a uh, as a um, an examiner, external examiner, or occasionally on holiday to visit uh, friends. At Chambézy, from the veranda, in the early evening light with binoculars, look over the trees on the shore the railway track, the calm expanse of Lake Clément, and let your gaze rise up above Geneva towards the final. The lenses tune the sound, a passing train slides by. In the ocular old the spectacle, the distance shoots back through the river into the brain. But high ice fields, the sounds that would be there, creaks, sharp cracks, the flash of pit for handhold to go. Scale. An arching amphitheatre of rugged ice, a stroll across a snow field could take a day, eternity, a long time in a life of ours to be on the edge. The cliffs are sheer, perpetual. Here, Frankenstein's monster shook his stolen limbs in rage and silence. Below these heights, the blue air blazing up in human A little group in Byron's house cooked up their brains of outcracked sex and violence. Every vein and sinew in its own intensity. While here, at the Chambésie, the wooden floor and panelling are calming. Bookshelves steady as the hand that pours a gin and tonic. The others waiting in the study, sunny in the evening. The alpine ice, the fevered brains, and our sedate and fires sketching. The delicate triangulation, balanced. Now we love poem from, from Istanbul. <clears throat> As a new moon she steps down the marble staircase, the mint kashmina bound around her throat, tossed back, a rising trail buoyant in the air of laughter and light, conversation below. Her eyes are intelligence, her face rose and pearl. The scarf lifts its silk as the moonhood tossed diamonds over the grace of her orbit. 
the slowest of Europe. The sure. <coughs> that's the point on the octagon portrait. And now in the gold panel hall, the words on either side of her are compliments, as if the frogs and insects spoke applause along the river bank, like ripples on the base and rim of a fountain of gold and purple and marble, round the central dispensation, her promise and possession in this moving constellation. It's only that you are not here that makes the virtues and the facts of all you are seem wishful here. So there are a whole number of points about different places. But finally, the last part of the book, we get back to Scotland. And there are various ways of, I mean, the, the virtue of this is that there are various ways of seeing a place now in a different light. Everybody knows Hamlet, yeah? Everybody knows Hamlet. Remember the first scene of Hamlet? So for a long time I was thinking about that. And uh, teaching it. And, um, Wondering what it would be like if, if we did it in Scotland, and if we did it in Scots. So the, this is a, a wee, I'll read a wee a bit of the first scene of Hamlet um, in Scots. It makes it dark and funny. Was there? No, but answer me, hod and unfold yourself. Long live the king, Bernardo. Aye, fegs, when you're here on your time. Ever how done deed, or what you're kidding, Francesco? Mercy day, it's called a nuke, and I'm rich seeker here. Can you a quiet gird? There's no a mooster. Weel, weel, good night. Can you sit see to other souls? Tell them, mark haste. I'm thinking I'm hearing them here. Hod, what's that? Friends, friends to this grunt, I and Leo men to the Dane, I, Weel and good night. Fare we honest soldier, what is your place, Bernardo? Good night. Oh, Bernardo? Aye. It's Horatio, we. Aye, Weel, I see him. Fare fall and welcome. Horatio, Marcellus, and his young thing appeared again the next. I've seen Nathan yet. Horatio says it's Nathan, but we're fan types. He'll not give you any credit in the Greenfield sick I've seen here twice. See, I've brought him here. They stand at him in the minutes of this night. Again, this vision come, he'll grant you her e'en were true. And spear it. Face to face, it'll not appear. But now sit down. Enter the ghost. Beast, oh beast, you know. This quarrel gangs again. And the self same, self like look of the king that's deep. Horatio, <coughs> you're a learned man. Spear it at new. Is it no the king's own image? Do you, do you care at new, Horatio? Face like. I am done for it all with fear and wonder. It begs you, Spiro, I Spiro it, Horatio. What like are ye, you usurper, of this time of night? We fair and warlike form, the like of how the buried king of Denmark marched himself at times. Speak! In God's name, speak! It's taken umbrage. Look, the irks are long. Hod, hod, and speak! Exit. <laughs> so they carry on talking for a wee bit, and then the ghost comes back. Remember the, remember the first scene, it's right. Beast, look, look, there it comes again. I'll beard it though it blast me. Hod still, ya spook! <laughs> can you have a sooner voice that you can use? Let's hear it. If there is only good that I can do that make the ease to you and grace to me, let's hear it. If you can offer this your country's fate, which can we can't at new we make the void, give voice to it. Or can you have snatched a secret load in life for ill fair treasure, hid in the way of the yard, for what deep spirits walk, or so as to speak out? The cock crows. Let's hear it, hod new and speak. Marcellus, put it back. I'll hack it with my pipe. Hear it, hear it, hear it's a wall. We do offence at so said Kingly Bear and they try out the violence, for it is as the air, we can't even it. And we're vain cries, just mockery. It was gone to speak, when yon cock crew. Then it stared that the skin it felt its guilt and heard its summons. I've heard the cock that trumps the morn and walkings up the day caused back the day. It faded with a cock crow in the air. For after that the spirits roam no mere, then nichts are fine and no ill chance befalls us, nor which is dear's hair. I've heard the same myself, and they believe it. But look, the morn is riz in gramercy. Gangs o'er the dew of thon he he's for prey. Rack up now, and by my best advisement, let's speak of this we've seen the nicht, to Hamlet, the young cup, for certes as I breathe. The spirit done to us will speak to him. Are we agreed we should acquaint him with? 
That's need for any other realty. And that's fit so decent. That's dear. Aye. And I this morning can't. Or we shall fight him skulking close to the eye. Thanks. That's all right. You can clap if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Gives me a wee minute to think what I'm going to do next. Um, I'll, I'll draw to you up close, I think, with a couple of Scottish poems then. Uh, Orkney. Visiting Orkney. Um, <coughs> the Orkney Archipelago of the North Sea. Various, various islands come into the book. The Orkney Archipelago, Harris, Lewis, uh, various other uh, the Hebrean islands. In fact, I remember I went to I went to the Outer Hebrides for the first time with an uncle of mine, and we roamed around a bit, just wandering and looking uh, on a rainy holiday. Um, and uh, I met um, a couple there uh, who ran a, 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 an arts festival. And they invited me to go back and, and read poems from the uh, well, That was a very nice way. So I was living in Ayr and I went to the railway station and I asked the guy behind the counter if he could advise me because previously I'd gone uh, with my uncle, as I say, we'd, we'd driven, we got the ferry, and this time I said, uh, I'd go by public transport if that's possible. Could you advise me on trains uh, that then connect with Caledonian McBrain ferries that do the outer islands? And then the inner as well. Uh, I want to go back to, to the Isle of Harris, to Harris to, to be part of this marsh festival. And um, the guy said, It's not funny. I mean, that can't be right. And he went and he rummaged through drawers, got various secrets, and he came back. I said, No, sir, that's, that's not right. That's the <coughs> Caledonia and McBrain's ferries don't go to Paris. <laughs> <laughs> And I should have said to him, you know, oh, yeah, they do, it's all been changed. They go via Dublin and then down and up the sea and they go the... <laughs> Orkney, we were in Or- I was in Orkney, and uh, I'll read two poems, two Orkney poems. No, I'll just read one. The <coughs> last one, drawn back by magic. Um, whatever the hand holds, camera, paintbrush, Pencil, pen, the fingertips upon the laptop's keys, the paper, screen, or canvas, the <laughs> air the senses carry in. Make traces, tracks, a patterning that moves out from the place and its location on the clock. To be caught, glimpsed, held on, whatever may be, and at whatever time, but never trapped. That is what work we do. What help it might be crosses then to now. But it is not only that. It also brings you back. Something unplanned, intuitive, relaxed. Working in the bones and muscle way below the memory of things. Abstraction. Yet as real as that salt spray that hit you like a shower switched on when the ferry smashed the cross wave and a blast of blue and green turned white as frost and drenched you in a sudden cold. As if all resolution, steel and ice were sensitized. At that moment in Kirkwall Cathedral, writing in the book, the third time now to see in Orkney what has changed and what remains, and by whatever chance and will should be, what's drawn back by magic. Thank you. Lanarkshire, January, low sun, late winter afternoon. Shadows stroll and stretch themselves across the green fields and the iron earth. The white screen light is cold and clarifies on paths white with frost. All the lengthening day. From Loudon Hill to Tinto, from Darvo to John Clark. Spires of village churches sharpen themselves in the air. Branches click like blades or needles in the breeze. Covenanter land, a hard terrain of outdoor congregations, sheer determination, beliefs you'd stand and die with, live for in commitment, be determined by.
bare trees strain the sunlight in the sky. I'll end, I'll end with uh, two, two points. Drumelia uh, is a place uh, in the borders that's supposed to be the, the, the burying place of Merlin. Of course, there's more than one Merlin. Anyway, I was there with a friend of mine, and the strange thing that happened uh, was not only to me, but also to my pal, Samuel. Yeah. This is what this is it. I have to try to make some sense of this strange place. It is as if translation had been made. In language I can't emulate or describe, but remember it like this. I pulled the van over on the gravel by the side road, switched off the engine. Jim and I got out. The sudden interruption of movement machine, the sharp metallic edge of the van door shutting, key grating with a lock, released us into sunlight afternoon. A, close but loo a loose but close assembly of trees, these silver green mystery. The breeze was shifting through them in directions, unpredictable. It was warm. We walked across the road down a yellow grass bank to the flat triangle of field beside the Pousel Park running there beside us towards the feet, which we couldn't see, lower in a cut in the valley ahead of us, where we could see the shadow of the dark walls of trees beyond on the other side of the river. The shadows seemed to move among the leaves, and slowly the perceptible audible context was changed. We could hear no more the rustling of the leaves. We could hear instead an actual conversation taking place. You know how it is when your mind's half-focused, your ears and eyes in a crowd, and what you hear and what you see are indistinct, but certain, present, there. This was like that. An actual conversation, voices. More than two, a crowd, as if a party, talking, murmuring too low to hear exactly what or what their speech was of. Unobtrusive, unbelievable. We looked around and then at each other. Can you hear it? Why? Silent smile, another, no explanation possible, then or now. No one else nearby at all, for miles. We waited in the middle of the voices as they spoke, not to us exactly, for us. Certainly we overheard or heard what was within their world as it was ours, then turned and walked away from them. More than 20 years from then to this. Maybe I decided long ago, there are some things no answers help. I've heard of fearful ghosts, but this was something warm, good, a kind of shared acknowledgement, an explain, a strange translation, a mass of living language from beyond, whatever it was we could see so clearly. <laughs> okay, I'll, just, uh, I'll finish with this last one called Crest, Crest, Crep, Crepuscap, Crepusculario. <laughs> this is a poem that I actually published in a magazine when I was here in New Zealand, and I'd forgotten about it. And when this book was about to be published, I had an email from someone in Australia. He said, are you the person who wrote that poem that's been in my mind for about 15, 20 years, called Crepusculario? Oh, yeah. And I found it again, and so it's right here at the end. Crepusculario. In darkness how they haunt us, these shadows of the past we know. A past we always know we are on the point of superseding. Always in the moment of the dawn's anticipation, letting go of an evening spent before this sun begins. May all the hauntings be of favoured memories of real things, not things you'd wish forgotten or that never should have happened. Let them linger in their traces as they go. Let them lead to this. <laughs> We had hoped to have some of Alan's books available for sale, but unfortunately they didn't arrive from Scotland in time. So we're just going to keep the music of Alan's poetry in our heads for the time being. We are grateful to the Central Library for hosting this event this afternoon, and we are deeply grateful to Alan Weir for having been such a marvellous addition to the cultural life of our city over the past year. Thank you, Alan. Thank you very much.